Well, welcome back to the Sermon Notes Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Strother, and with me today once again is my good friend, Brian Ball. Brian, thanks for filling in for me last week. And this season, we are walking through the entire Bible chronologically across all of our Brentwood Baptist campuses. So this week, we'll continue our study of 2 Samuel and kind of like binge watching a series, <laughs> right? The saga yeah. of David continues. And but continues. I, I do want to say thank you to everybody who's been listening. Got a lot of comments because uh, we can't obviously cover uh, all this narrative material on a Sunday morning. It's been encouraging that you guys are following along. And so we have been in the story of David. We're going to go back into the story of David once again today which is the uh, scene five of act two of the big story, Brian. Kings and prophets as God continues to shape a kingdom people. Absolutely. We we start to see, and as you preached yesterday out of Psalm 51, we start to see some of the fall of David, right? Some of the places where it's been so, where you've been so good up to now, to quote Lovett. Yeah. Right, but but kind of, this is where we start to see, and he's still a man after God's own heart. And I love your rendering of that Mm -hmm. is a, a man of God's choosing. Right. And what becomes glaringly obvious over these chapters is that he is ob- it's obviously nothing of David that caused him to be chosen. Yeah, I think it's really clear. A couple things. Number one is you could write a lot of country songs you out of the life of David. <laughs> you could. Uh, so four songs, right? I love you, I hate you, go away, come back again. Right. That's all the themes that you need. That's and exactly you can right. pretty much categorize every country song there is, but uh, I digress. <laughs> the, the idea here, of course, is that David is human. He is. And we need to remember that. For, for the fact that David, God used David in amazing ways. Uh, there's things that we rightly look at David's life and we want to emulate. We want his chutzpah. We want his faith and courage. You know, we want his his heart for, yep. for God and the way he expresses himself to God as, as we see in many of the Psalms. But, but David is still a, a flawed character. Absolutely. And so that's our hope is that we put our hope in a future king, a that's king right. that is to come, which is all about what God's covenant promise to David is all about. That's exactly right. And we see it comes as encouragement to us, right? Because mm-hmm. we certainly live broken lives. That's we right. certainly live sinful lives, but we can still be chosen by God, yeah. right? Because Jesus came and died so that the whole world may believe. Yeah. And so that, you know, he offers that salvation as a free gift. Mm-hmm. And so that's very, I take it as very encouraging that when we see the brokenness of these characters, we see the brokenness of Moses, yeah. we see the brokenness of Abraham, and that that's encouraging to us because we know how broken we are. Yeah. And yet there's still hope. Yeah, Christ there's an old saying, right? Everything has cracks in it, and that's how the light gets through. That's exactly right. And so that's, that's certainly good news. Beautiful. Good news for us. And maybe maybe a, a, a good starting point as we begin to look at some of the cracks in <laughs> David's life, beginning yes. in Second Samuel chapter 11, where we need to spend some time kind of deconstructing temptation. Yeah, and you know, it, it it David was really successful and powerful, mm-hmm. right? But but he but the more self sufficient he felt, right, the farther he drifted from God. We stopped seeing less references of and he inquired of the Lord. Yeah. And he and he saw and right, we oh, that's such a good point, Brian. And and, and and but we don't really even see that again until chapter twenty three, yeah. I think. And, and it's so true to our condition. One of the things I mentioned yesterday mm-hmm. in the sermon is this idea that uh, trials and, and, and those things will test our faith. Right. But so will success. Well, and that's I love the ESV translation of Philippians four, yeah. where it's where Paul says, "I have learned the secret of facing plenty." Mm-hmm. Right, and 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 we don't often think of plenty as a challenge. Mm-hmm. But that's what God's word says. I've learned the secret of facing plenty because that can corrupt us and destroy us at, at least as easily. Yeah, part right? of the way that God has wired the world is for us to be dependent on Him. That's right. You know, we we want to be codependent on other people or other things, but right. God wants us to have a healthy level of dependence on Him because there's some things that only He can do. That's exactly right. Uh, and so the temptation for us when we become successful or powerful to any degree is to think, well, f- I don't need God. This this was me the whole time. Right. A- and so David, obviously on the run from Saul, uh, in battles, you know, was constantly depending, like you said, inquiring upon the Lord. But yeah. we see less and less of that, and so we open chapter 11 and he's at a different stage of his life and his career he is and and it's and it, i love that it was spring and you mentioned this in the summer right spring when kings went out to war but david didn't go out to war yeah when i was youth pastor we kind of developed these five five big rules 
you know, because I got tired of creating a new set of rules for every camp and retreat. So rule number five was be where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's right. And David's violating <laughs> rule that number five at, at this point, you know, and again, at, at some point in your career, a lot of guys don't go out to the front lines anymore. Right. But that's where David was successful because that's where he was dependent on the Lord. That's exactly right. And so what this idle time enabled to happen, right, kind of a boredom sets in for David and his mind and his heart begins to wander. Well, and he goes up on the roof just kind of what seems like wandering around. Yeah. Right. And so and then he sees Bathsheba. Yeah, and 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 something something triggers in his heart, yeah. and that's and that's and that's what this is a story of God, and then how David's faithfulness faithlessness toward God plays out in his life. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's not looking at Bathsheba as well, he should look at her because he Bathsheba, well, I think her father and and grandfather that's were right. mighty men. That's right. And Both so, I mean, served David. Right. I mean, direct service of David, and there were like thirty, I think, in the generally of thirty mighty men around him. Yeah. And so it's not like he didn't know her dad and granddad personally. Yeah. And when you think of that level of of you know, corruption. I don't know what the right word is, but when you think of that level of when you know her that well, and then you still treat her in this objectionable way, yeah. You know, where where is your heart? Yeah, right? yeah. And, that, and that's and that's the question, right? That that's what uh, the whole narrative again is about: what we see versus what God sees. That's right. And David, mm, instead of fantastic. submitting himself and seeing through the eyes of God, right? God sees the the heart, but right. man looks at outward appearances. Yep. At this point, David's just looking at outward appearances. There is no doubt. And if you've ever been in the Middle East, you'll know, especially Jerusalem itself, even the city of David, you can go there to this day where they've excavated parts. It's on a hillside, right. and so you can see all of these rooftops. You can see how this would easily take place, and so. Again, extra biblical, but you can just imagine David surveying, you know, his right. city. Right. I've conquered this place, you know, I've built this palace, you know, and there's one of my subjects. Right. And so it's interesting. I think it's Eugene Peterson who notes this in his commentary is, you know, I always say you are loved and you are sent. Yep. That biblically speaking, the word sending is this missionary God. Mm-hmm. Well, now David abuses his power and he yeah. sends for Bathsheba. Right. He, he manipulates the God-delegated authority that God had given him for his own selfish gain, and he takes what's not his. Yeah, and that's an incredible insight. And and, and, and perverting those things of God yeah. is, is where sin begins and often propagates. Yeah, sin is always a distortion, right? right? It's, a, it's, a, it's taking a good gift, right, and using it, misusing it, misapplying it, you know, and so taking God's good gift of sexuality outside of the boundaries of a covenant marriage between one man and one woman for life time always ends up in disaster that's exactly well it's anytime you sin right leads to death yes no 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 exceptions and so something's going to die yeah and we see that here right Mm -hmm. as he as he calls as as david calls her husband home and and tries to tries to you know basically deceive him into going home and laying with one and and rise is so honorable yeah he won't leave he won't leave the palace he says when the ark and my and my men are in battle there's no way i can go home yeah. And and li- and be in this comfort, and so we see that contrast, you know, even deepen between right. a man who's still focused on the right priorities and right. one who isn't. Right, and and so we see David, and when that's unsuccessful, right, David sends him into the battle, mm-hmm. and to, and with his own carrying his own destruction. Yeah carrying a note of his own destruction. Yeah, and we and we need to, to, to make a note here. We, we get to this point in the story, and it almost feels soap opera-ish, right. you know, and we're like, David, how, how could you? Right. And yet, when we look at our own lives, if we're really honest with ourselves, the depths of our own depravity yep. means, you, man, do never underestimate That's right. what you would do if if you had all the power yep. or you had total control yep. or you had your own way completely. Yep. You know, one of the things that God's grace does is that it restrains us. That's exactly right. You know, even even if we have the Holy Spirit in us, yep. we still have that old nature that Romans 6 and 7 talks about, yeah. right? Paul says, I, the things that I, I know I, I should do, do, I don't, do. <laughs> and vice versa, <laughs> right. right? The things that I, I don't need to be doing, I'm tempted to do yeah. on a regular basis. And so we all need that healthy dose of reality yep. that teaches us that our sin nature is still there. Uh, and there's an old, old saying, right? That if you're driving and you see the devil hitchhiking, don't, <laughs> don't stop pick to pick him up, him up. <laughs> because sooner or later he's going to want to drive. Yeah. And that, and, and you see that begin that, that evil, that sin begin to take over David's life. That's right. What, what, you know, is, is, is one sin begins to compound and right. it leads to other sins. Well, we always told our boys, you're God's grace away from any sin yeah you were literally god's grace so whatever sin you think is so horrible we were literally god's grace away from that. when i first uh, ministered to homeless uh, god brought me a vanderbilt graduate 
I'm a Vanderbilt graduate. Wow. And so we sat there in the table, and there were three decisions in his life that were different than mine, the reason we were sitting on each side of the table. Wow. And that was remarkable for the Lord to go, just in case you think you're anything. Mm. Let, let me remind you mm-hmm. of whose you are, yeah. right? Because the Lord has blessed me with this. Yeah. But remember that you are God's grace from any of this. Yeah. And so it was a wonderfully humbling moment, mm-hmm. right, to see that you know, I am not these things that the world labels me. Yeah. And Psalm 51, what does God not despise? A humble a and a contrite yeah. heart. That's exactly but right. But David's heart's grown proud. It has. And, and for a while, he thinks he gets away with it. Right. But God always sees. He does. Speaking he does. of seeing, God always knows. So even if we think we can hide it from everybody around us, God sees and he knows. He does. He yeah. does. And we look at kind of the road to destruction that David took. Because I really like this little, This I think you did mm-hmm. these notes, right? David blows past the stop signs. Yeah. I mean, he, he has the opportunity. And we see that in our lives, right? We, we maybe do a minor sin or something. And the Lord will, will give you warning signs oftentimes. Yeah. And, so you, and, and certainly your conscience, right? If the Holy Spirit is in you, there is conviction going on. That's that right. you have to disregard or ignore, right? And it's Romans 1. It's, it's mm-hmm. they suppress the truth. That's right. Right? And even we that are saved mm-hmm. oftentimes will suppress the truth, even, yep. even knowing that. But, right, David has disordered love. Yeah. Right? C.S. Lewis, right? He puts, his, he puts his lust and his desires above the Lord's desires, mm-hmm. and that will always lead us astray. Yep. Right? He uses his God-given ingenuity to his own, right, his own purposes and attempt to cover up his sin, mm-hmm. only leading to more sin. Yeah. Right. And then finally, right, David convinced himself that he'd gotten away with it. And, and as you said, but the Lord, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, right? The mm-hmm. end of that chapter, end of chapter 11. Yeah. And that's just, that's, it's it's so sad for him to deceive him because eventually that's what you have, end up doing with your sin. You end yeah. up deceiving yourself. That's right. Because that, And that's why you need, by the way, a community, people mm-hmm. around you, godly friends, life groups yeah. that will show you and go, hey, I'm, you know, what, do you, what are you doing on Saturday? What, what are you doing on these trips? Yeah. What are you that will ask you those questions, mm-hmm. right, to keep you oriented toward Christ? Yeah, yeah. You know, the word confession we talked about yeah. yesterday means to basically to agree. Yep. And so God already knows. Right. So all you're doing in confession, right, is saying, God, I, I agree with you that this, this is the depths of my sin. This is what I've done. Yep. Uh, this is, this is you know, I, I've got to own it and take responsibility for that. Yep. Um, but David needs somebody in, in God's grace to confront him with that, and that person is the prophet Nathan. Right. And, and it's interesting when you look at the kings, right, Saul had Samuel, David had Nathan, and we'll yeah. get to Solomon didn't have a priest. Yeah. Although he had all this wisdom, and we see how it ended, right? Ended up. We won't, I know we're going to hit, but yeah. right? We, 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 you yeah. can see how that ends. But yeah. this is the grace of a priest, yeah. right? The grace of someone to speak on. Here's what I think it means: everybody needs a preacher. That's right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but to be real, we yeah. need continually confronted with God's word. The preacher himself, right. by the way, needs yeah. that as well. But but we do need, by God's grace, his, his, somebody who says, whoa, hey, let, let's take a look at it. And and again, the way that the, the God brings his word about through Nathan is clever because it sneaks past David's defenses. Right, and he tells him a, a, a parable. Right, and, and and it angers David. He's like, who who could do such an unjust thing? Yeah, yeah. Who could take the, the poor man's lamb, lamb when the rich man has everything he wants? <laughs> right, and he goes, who is this man? Right, it's like the most <laughs> melodramatic moment in scripture. You know, my kids would go dun dun dun. Uh, you know, you have that music, but but it's but it's so true. You know, and not to kind of laugh at it. And at that point, right. as we talked about yesterday, David has to make a choice. Right, is he going to double down? I'm the king. You know, I, I'm, I'm the guy. The, and this is where I think we see true evidence that God's spirit is still on him. Yes. Because he does say, against the Lord, I have sinned. That's right. That's right. And we, we see him repent, right? We see his contriteness before the Lord. And, and when we see this, we're going to look at a couple of Psalms that, that were written in this time. We'll see that same contriteness, that same understanding of suffering, the understanding of, of, of his impenitence. Right through this season, and then finally repenting, yeah. finally confessing. So yeah. it's it's a beautiful thing. And, and so let's be really clear: we know that God is faithful and just to forgive. Yes. And yet, just like any good parent, uh, like any good coach, any good leader, He has to allow the natural consequences of our decisions to play out. That's exactly right, and He does that here, right? Because there there is tragedy that will beset David's family, yeah. and that the, right the sword will never leave him, and that he loses his child. Mm-hmm. Right, and he mourn- it's interesting, right? He mourns before the Lord before the child dies. Yeah. He does all these things. Then, when the child dies, he cleans himself up yeah. and goes and worships. Yeah, 
right? Because he says, well, the child was alive, Lord, but now that the child is gone, yeah. now that the child is dead. And it was interesting how his servants tried to protect him, knowing, right, knowing kind of mm-hmm. what the tragedy of his son's death would be yeah. and try to protect him. But he knows anyway that David the Lord had given David yeah. a sense of that because David knew what the price was, and his sin killed his child. Yeah, yeah. I mean, devastating. That's, that's just devastating. We, you know, if you've ever had a sick child, right? you know how hard yeah. you pray and how out of control you feel in that situation. Absolutely. And so the weight that David had to feel in that moment had to be immense. Well, even when it was where I have two sons with, with disabilities and even, yeah. you know, we didn't do anything to cause that. Right. But even then, those, those moments where there's peril, right, where you don't know whether your child's going to live or die, yeah. you don't know what their life is going to look like. Those are incredibly anguishing moments mm-hmm. on a parent. And I can't imagine something of my fault. Yeah causing causing such serious consequences yeah and david's at that point it goes the only place he knows to go which is the right place yeah, the lord. And he turns to the lord that's right and asks god to create a, a clean mm-hmm. heart in him to a renew a steadfast spirit in him to not cast him away from his presence or take his holy spirit from 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 away from him yeah. you know and i think that that's one of the things that david had lived he'd watched what happened when saul right the spirit yeah. of the lord would come on him but it also says right that saul would grieve the spirit right and then the spirit would leave and so david in this moment needed to cling to the promises of God, and so do we. Right. In the sense that God had said, my spirit will always be on you from this day forward. And so David, you know, I I think in a big picture, wasn't at risk of losing the spirit of God because that promise had been made to him, but yet we can, in New Testament terms, grieve the spirit. Absolutely. And, 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 even when we do that, we go back to Romans 12, right, where it says there's nothing that can come between That's right. you and the Spirit, right? Yeah. And it lists all these things that you think. You know, yeah, Romans 8. Yeah. Right, Romans yeah. 8, I'm sorry. 38 and 39. Yeah. You're right, though. But where all these things could grief. Yeah, where all these things could, uh, yeah, if I've obviously, yeah, anyway. You were right but, there. I know, but yes, anyway, but that list, right, yeah. where all those yeah. all those things that could separate us from God, but, yeah. but absolutely can. They seem so powerful mm-hmm. when you look on them. Yeah, life nor death, angels right. nor demons, right? right? Nor anything high or anything below. Right, and, and none of that can touch that relationship. And it's the same thing for David here because the Spirit had come down upon yeah. him. Yeah, and so it's important for us to remember when we're talking about sin, right? We sin. God's right where he's always been. Right. And so we we were the ones who, who you know, break that fellowship. And so it, it, when we come to him and we confess right. and, and we fall on his grace and mercy— then that's when we receive that grace and that's when that fellowship is restored. That's right. And that's what David is, is longing for, that's to right. feel that closeness of God's presence again. And he and he sees that even though, as you said, these dire consequences yeah. come upon his family. And so we start to see that, right? That even David's son yeah. rises up against yeah. him. Yeah, so let's pause there real quick too because I want to make this point. Um, because especially in our Baptist tradition, there's kind of this, you know, once saved, always saved, you know, which, you know, I hate that yes. term. It's not scriptural. It not uh, perseverance of the saints. Saints is yes. the doctrine, which is very different than that attitude. But sometimes there's this attitude, well, I'm going to go ahead and with the sin because God has already promised to forgive me. Right. Okay. Pay attention to the next several chapters. Right. Like watch the trajectory of David's life and the pain and the anguish that is he forgiven and restored with God? Yes. yes. 100%. But are the consequences absolutely devastating? They are. 100%. They are. Because what you have is a magnification of David's sin now that's going to run amok in his family. That's exactly right. And through generations. That, and that's what's just tr- just tragic. And tens of thousands of lives at stake. Yeah. Right? That, that, that tens of thousands died. Yeah, David of- knows by the end of Psalm 51, I didn't have time to get to it yesterday, but he ends with these two lines about you know the nation itself. Yeah. In other words, the more responsibility you're given, the more power you have, the, you know, Know, that they, the way you lead is going to affect you, your family, and all of the people in Israel. That's exactly right, and that's why we we need to pray for and support our leaders. Yeah, great right? point. The people, the, tr- the trustees, the pastors. Good application, the, yeah. And so we've got to, to be in prayer for them mm-hmm. because there's a significant weight that the Lord has put on them yeah. by, by their position in the kingdom. And so being sure to pray and support and, and, and do that on a regular basis. Um, beautiful, beautiful things go on. Beautiful yeah. things go on. All right, so David's sin, right, plays out. Um, and, of course, the horrific rape of Tamar, yeah. and that just causes chaos in the family. Yeah. Right? Murder. Yeah, it, it well, it's just, by her own brother, right? right? And so another brother, right, tries to stand up because we really see David kind of now being passive. Right. Which, by the way, is another consequence of sin. Because when we're, we're, you know, guilty of our own sin and we feel ashamed of that, right. then we don't feel very strong to stand up for what we know is right and true. Right. Even though the Lord says, you have been restored, mm-hmm. we don't believe him. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? And, and that's what goes back to, do you trust him? Mm-hmm. When he forgives you, do you actually believe? Because those cycles will play in your head, right? Yeah. And I, if they only knew who I was, if they only knew this about me, yep. right? They would never listen. They would never. And, it's, and the Lord says, okay, let's go back to this. You've been forgiven. Yeah. That's now part of your testimony. Yep. So when somebody calls out, you go, yeah. But, but let me tell you what Jesus did. Yeah. Right. That, that was me. And let me tell you how the Lord saved me. And that becomes part of our testimony. Mm-hmm. And we don't but we don't see that here. We see these tragedies, right, of sin echoing down through the generation. Yeah. And so honor, shame, culture. Yep. So Absalom's sister has been shamed. Yep. So now he's going to take honor into his own hands. And this is always bad when humans <laughs> try to take justice into their own hands. Right. Not delegated by God, but just acting on their own. And so he murders his brother. And so now the prophecy has come true. Right. The sword has come to the house of David. That's exactly Exactly right. And it doesn't leave, mm-hmm. right? Because he pursues Absalom, right? And 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 then David kind of tries to restore Absalom, yeah. but doesn't bring him into the house. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going, you, all this is going to do is breed resentment. Yeah. I mean, you, you would you would say all Yeah, resentment is, is a good word for it. Because that's what it did. That's, that's all it brings in. And so Absalom would go stand at the gate. Yeah. Right? And basically. For under, like two years. Right, and undermine his father's kingdom. Yeah. It was just just incredible. And David allows that to take place. Again, because I don't think David knows what to do at this moment. He doesn't know how to make this right. Right. You know, he's made himself right with God, but he doesn't know how to reconcile this among his children. Well, and I don't know that God gave him the authority to do that, Mm. right? Because he, God said, this is what's going to play out. Mm. And so David may have been, you know, anything he could have done with Absalom. Mm. The Lord just did not give him that to be able to do. Yeah. And so Absalom starts acting like any, any kid who's trying to get their father's attention. He like starts starts messing things up, setting stuff on fire, right? right? Anything to get dad's attention, even yep. if it's in a negative way. And he did lots of that, right? He did lots of that. All the way to full-scale rebellion. Right. And so, and right. And so David goes on the run again. Yeah. Again. Yeah. At this point, you know, and Absalom does all kinds of horrific things in the, in the city that was prophesied before. And so, right, well, these, these sins that were said would be committed against David happen. Yeah, um, that's right. And, so that's it's, right. It's, and really, remember, that's what that was. Right. You know, it's a stealing of the kingdom. That's exactly it's a, right. It's a show of authority where, yep. where Absalom, and again, re- connected back to the sin of Bathsheba, he is reenacting, you know, and, and even heightening David's sin that's with right. Bathsheba that's in right. the same location, by the way, on the roof of the palace. Right. And that, and all of that coming back had to hit David. Of uh, this was where this started, mm-hmm. and then now this is where I've been disgraced. Yeah, right. I was disgraced to in, inside when I was up there by myself. Yeah, and now I've been disgraced by myself. And so for a short time, Absalom he gains yeah. control Absolutely. of the capital, and David is on the run. However, David is still God's anointed Messiah. Right, and rebellion. Uh, rarely ends well. That's exactly right, and it didn't. It, it did not for Absalom. And we get a lot about hair. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot about hair. Yeah, we we get this interesting little passage about Absalom's <laughs> hair, and you know how how much it weighed, and <laughs> yeah. how long his locks were, and you're yeah. kind of like, what's that all about? And then until Absalom is on the run, yep. and his hair gets tangled in a tree. Right, and he hangs on a tree, as we remember from, from Leviticus, and that anything that right hangs mm-hmm. on a tree is cursed. Yeah. And so eventually one of David's men, even though instructed not to harm Absalom, That's right. one of David's men comes. Yeah, Joab the, the commander's like, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to take I'm justice I'm into done. my own right. hands. And does it. And runs him through with a spear. Yep. Three, to be precise. Right. And then they and they stick him over in a pit and pull, pile a bunch of rocks on him. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's just a tragic end, right, within David. And it crushes David's spirit. It does. It crushes it David's It does. Spirit. David's the cries here have been used in and I've heard him preach many times before at funerals, just talking about the depths of grief right. uh, for a lost child. Yeah. And so, you know, it's again so tragic. It is. And, and as David has to trace it traces that back to his sin, he he has to begin to realize that these consequences are absolutely devastating. They are. They are. And so finally we get to write chapter 21. It's the first time in, in nearly forever, it seems, that mm-hmm. David seeks the Lord. Yeah. Right? After three years of famine. And so we note that David's early successes came with inquiring of the Lord first, and in times he did not, the Lord intervened to save him, but not so in these chapters. Yeah. And so we see him fade. 
Right. We see that, that David, so he does not. Yeah, the strong. ending of David's life is very uneven, yeah. I think is the best way to put it, as you read through these different stories. And, and even some of them are at the very end of Second Samuel, kind of out of chronological order. Because right. it's kind of like, we, we don't know where any of these things <laughs> fit the put author, together. so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put these into there. But, but, but again, you, you know, it's not the ending we had hoped for David. Right. So I think before we hit a couple of the Psalms, there, there's a couple of things that, that we want to point out, right? First of all, especially in this tragic story of rebellion, you know, this guy Absalom, them. We want to distance ourselves, but but in reality, we're all rebels. That's exactly right. We all want our own throne. Yep. We all want our own kingdom. Yep. And so a lot of times we will try to take matters in our own hands to make that happen. And worse yet, sometimes we will twist things of God. Yeah. Right. To make them to make them serve our own purposes. Mm-hmm. And that's just yeah. tragic. And in both what the reflection on the kingdom, right? And then of course the inner the inner destruction. Yeah, so that cautionary tale. Again, a lot of stories in the Bible are there to teach us from a negative example. Yep. Right? Don't do this, don't go that direction. But yet still we see God's sovereignty prevailing. Yep. Despite the mess, despite the sin, despite the brokenness. Yep. And so what David longed to do for Absalom, remember he cried, I, I wish I could take his place, yep. right? Die in his place. Christ ultimately did for us <laughs> he did. in taking our place yep. on a tree with a spear stuck through his, his side. side. So if all these things are sounding familiar, it's because they should, because right. they're they're pointing us to to that greater story. What David could not do, right? Jesus Christ did as Absolutely. the perfect king. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and too, I think it's important noting God wasn't finished with David. Right. This isn't the end of David's story, as we said. You know, he we're gonna talk about his his kind of final words, his final song next week. But our past sins, they plague us. But in Christ, they don't have the power to define us. That's exactly anymore. right. That's exactly right. Well, and, and God sa- right, saves you. From, so you were a slave to sin. That's right. Right before you and I were saved. Mm-hmm. And now we're slaves to righteousness. Yeah, good. Right? And, 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 and so that sin doesn't have that kind of power yeah. that it did. Well, I think of what Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where he says, this is what I was. Right. Right. That's this, right. This is who, who you were as a people. We were this long list of things he <laughs> of gives. Terrible things. Right. right. <laughs> but but now we are redeemed. We're saved. Yep. We're sanctified. Right. And, and so we need to remember that reality. As I preached on two weeks ago, Psalm 23, a lot of scholars think it was written while David was on the run from Absalom. Yeah. Surely goodness and mercy right. will pursue me all the days of my life right. and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I mean, you know, so so you have this juxtaposition in David's heart of dealing with the messy consequences, but but in his best moments as he's close with the Lord, realizing what he has by grace. That's right. Not by his works. That's right. Because he ended up creating a mess of things, right. like many of us do. But but we know that those words are powerful, and we know that they're true, That's right. and that our identity is in Christ. That's right. Not in our past, not in our sin, but the enemy keeps us tethered to that so that we won't live lives that are victorious, so that we won't, we'll live our lives looking back instead of looking forward to God's grace and his mercy and his goodness. We won't live free lives, as we've yeah. talked about, right? Certainly That's talked good. about early in these things, that yeah. we have a freedom in Christ that we often don't live. Yeah. And we forget that we're a free people, Mm -hmm. that we are free to live in obedience to God. And that's the way to be free is in obedience to God because everything else leads to death. Mm -hmm. And God wants us to have life. That's right. right. Life abundantly. And so we do that in obedience to life that does not lack. That's right. Eugene Peterson's right book. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's that's just so good. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. So a couple of Psalms. Yep. uh, You know, that are again interwoven in our Bible reading during this time. Uh, uh, Psalm 32. We've talked on Sunday mornings about Psalm 23. Psalm 51 now. Psalm 32, blessed are the forgiven. That's right. That's right. It starts off, right, with blessed is accepted. First couple verse are blessed is acceptance. And I found this list of kind of man's perspective versus God's perspective on sin. And I thought this was powerful. This is, this is from Steve Lawson in his book Psalms. I think it's page 75, 175. It says, man calls it an accident. God calls it an abomination. Hmm. Man calls it a blunder. God calls it blasphemy. Man calls it a chance. God calls it a choice, right? Echoes of judges, right? Uh, Man calls it an error. God calls it an enmity. Man calls it fascination. God calls it a fatality. Mm -hmm. Man calls it an infirmity. God calls it an iniquity. Man calls it luxury. God calls it leprosy. Mm -hmm. Man calls it liberty. God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it a trifle. God calls it a tragedy. Man calls it a mistake. God calls it madness. Man calls it weakness. God calls it willfulness. Mm. 
That'll preach. That as will we preach. Say. That will preach. And it, you look back at a couple of those things, right? We think liberty is a good thing, but it's only freedom in Christ. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, it becomes lawlessness, rebellion, mm-hmm. and, right, and license, right. And, that, and those things are never constructive toward us. But we see this, right? That blessed is the acceptance. So that, right, and you love this. For when I was silent, right, my bones wasted away. But right through my groaning all day long, for one night your hand was heavy on me. My strength dried up by the heat of the summer. And we see that such a you, such a tangible, just visceral description of what sin does to us. Right. And and that's what you love about the Psalms is that artistic and kind of emotional component mm-hmm. to to the theology of scripture right you love kind of seeing the depth yeah. that it brings yeah in. but as the first verse says blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven that's right whose sin is covered that's right we need our sin to be covered we can't clean up ourselves that's exactly right that's exactly right and so it, right so we see the folly of impent of impenitence right so that we when we don't confess our sins right sin brings physical and spiritual suffering mm-hmm. right we see that death every time right and we know that not all suffering is caused by discipline but in this yeah. case it's very specific specific as the psalmist is saying, that these are my sins that are bringing this about and on me. And and when I kept silent, right, when I did not confess my sins, mm-hmm. and that was their state. But what's beautiful is, right, he brings a way of deliverance. Mm-hmm. Right, verses five, 6 and 7, he says, we must acknowledge our sin, confess our sin, and seek the Lord. Yeah, that same connection is in Psalm 51. Yep. It's there throughout Scripture, and that's why I went to First John chapter 1 yesterday yep. to, to point that verse out, because because the pathway from our sin to God's grace is confession. That's right. That's right. And if we and it, it's not just acknowledging our sin. It's confessing it before the Lord and seeking the Lord. Because yeah. you can also Repentance, be sorry. Right. Which uh, literally means to turn around. Right. I know that's an old-fashioned word. Repent, repent, right? But but it's a significant one. It's one we've got to reclaim. Right. Because it means we're going away from God. We're going our own way in our rebellion. But it means that we stop by God's grace and we reorient ourselves to him yep. and we walk it back, right? Yep. We, we, you know, we, we, we come back into right relationship with him. We change our ways and we burn down, by the way, whatever it is that was in the past. So That's whatever exactly. it is, it takes us, right, to, to keep from going back there. We get rid of it. That's right. You know, we toss it in the trash. We, we put up the boundaries. We, we get accountability around yep. us in community. Whatever it is, we move away from it so we can move our heart back to God. That's exactly right. And repentance was ironic. Right? There are a lot of words culture has taken. Right, love. Oh, sure. Right? The culture has to take a repentance. Yeah. We've just kind of laid it down. Yeah. Wow. That's a powerful point. We've just kind of laid it down. Yeah. And that's one of the things we taught our boys in daily disciplines, right, is repentance and confession. Yeah. Right. You do your scripture study, you do your prayer, and you do repentance and confession. Yeah. Because that's what brings our hearts, right, mm. back to God. We seek the Lord in those things. Mm. And you got to, again, we, we set that one down. Yeah. Nobody took that from yeah, us. Yeah, and that and the pathway to joy and gladness, as David said, is on the that's, other side of that. That's exactly right. It, that's if exactly you try to suppress right. it, you try to ignore it, you're just going to continue to have this this guilt and this shame and this gloom, right, that, that just eats you alive. Yep. And so as we confess and repent, as we deal with our stuff, then yep. God deals graciously with us. Yep. And there is joy and gladness. On that's the other right. side. That's right. Joy and obedience, right? Joy of obedience is the last couple of verses, right? As we learn, and he wants us to learn from the psalmist's experience, mm-hmm. the writer of the yeah. psalm. He says, right, submit to the Lord's instruction, trust in the Lord, and be glad in the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that's where you get to the other side of repentance. Mm-hmm. That's where you get to on the other side of confession. Just beautiful. Yeah. Just yeah, beautiful stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. And so the other psalm in there is Psalm 102, uh, which again oh. is that reminder to bring it to God. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Yep. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. Desperation. Yeah. Right. Good word. It's a desperate prayer. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so beautiful. And what's really interesting about this one is we don't know the cause of the suffering. Yeah. It's not like they're confessing sin. The psalmist mm-hmm. confessing sin. It's But it's suffering. And then th- verses 3 through 11, we see this the, the visceral reality mm-hmm. of the suffering there yet, yeah. right? There's there's transience. I see that I'm not going to be here very long. It's just like I'm, I'm, I'm missed. Mm-hmm. And there's withering, right? Yeah. You see I'm lost away. My skin clings to my bones. Yeah. It, and how visual that is. Yeah. Right, and the inability to sleep. They, they won't rest, right? And, and, and it's, it's an amazing description. You go from desperation to the reality. Again, not anything God doesn't know, not anything you don't know, yeah. but confessing it before the Lord. Well, and again, I think big picture, it's one way of saying, hey, life is short. Yep. Get right with God now. Right. Like, don't, don't wait. 
yep. right? Bring, bring your bring your stuff to him. And to your point, coming full circle with where we started today, it's dependence. That's right. Dependence upon the Lord to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, to set me right with him, yep. and to face the consequences of what whatever I've unleashed in my life, but do it knowing that he will never leave me or forsake me. Do it trusting God. That's right. Do it in trusting God. And that's what I love about how this, this, this psalm ends, is it gives us seven characteristics of God. Mm-hmm. Because when we're desperate in our circumstances, yeah. we're in difficult places, we don't need to look to ourselves. Yeah. And we don't need yeah. to look around. We need to remember who God is. That's right. The most solid thing in the universe is who he is. That's exactly right. And when we see him for who he really is, then we see ourselves and our circumstances in the correct light. Yeah. And it's beautiful, right? It shows his, his eternal kingship, his compassion, his sovereignty, his power, mm-hmm. right? His mercy. And though then verse 17 echoes back to the end, which I think are vastly underappreciated <laughs> verses at the end of Exodus 2, where, yeah. where the people just cry out. They don't even cry out to God. Yeah. And right. And, and God, God heard, mm-hmm. God remembered, yeah. God saw, and God knew. Yeah. Good. That's his mercy. Mm-hmm. And that, that word knowing in Hebrew, remember, yada, he knows right. intimately. That's right. He knows what you're going through. He knows your story. So confess it, bring it to him, yep. and then let this be recorded for a generation to come yep. so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and like I say, just going back and remembering who God is, that, that cha- it really changes everything. And that's why we, I love you, preach the gospel to yourself. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what reminds us of who God is, what he's done for us, what these things are. Yeah. So we've got a couple takeaways. Yeah. A couple takeaways, right? God, right? God is there for us to hear and obey. And in the times when we stray, he still forgives us. He's mm-hmm. still, I love what you said. He, he hasn't moved. He hasn't changed. That's right. right? It's, it's it's our obedience that's that's the varying thing in that, right? And in man, we will stray from the Lord, but when in humility we confess our sin and seek the Lord in repentance, He will forgive us, right? And this forgiveness does not necessarily remove the consequences of our sin, mm-hmm. but it, but if we will seek Him, right, we will find Him. Um, Jesus, right? Jesus, as you said, this whole thing. <laughs> It's Christ, yeah. right? He will forgive our sins, our iniquities. He took them to the cross. He died, was raised from the dead so that we could have hope yeah. right, in his righteousness. Yeah, I, ho- I hope you're seeing the theme because right. it's going to continue. <laughs> the right. longing for a true and better king. Yep, yep. And so what do we do? We repent and seek the Lord, right? Follow his commands. And that's, it's really that, well, it's a very, feels a very Sunday school answer. That's literally what we need to do. Mm-hmm. And we, and it's so. That's I, like the old hymn, trust and obey. obey. <laughs> for there's no other way. way. <laughs> it just there, there's just there's enough. just not you know and that's one of the the gifts of reading the Bible through as we see those things yeah. consistently it's beautiful so, beautiful all man. right we'll beautiful kind of stuff. wrap up the life of David and continue to look at some of the Psalms and uh, we'll continue to move through the storyline next week uh, we've covered a lot this week as well <laughs> yeah. but uh, that's it for today's episode of Sermon Notes podcast thank you for hanging with us we hope you found our discussion helpful and if you did help us out by leaving a review in your podcast app or dropping a comment in the YouTube comments below. If you have questions about anything you've read, you can leave those in the comments as well, and we'll try to answer a few next week. As always, thank you for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time.